Hello and welcome to the Black Doctors Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Nate Jones. He's a pediatrician and currently finishing up a pediatric emergency medicine fellowship. He attended medical school and college at Rutgers. I asked about different challenges he had to overcome on the pathway to becoming a physician. Hello, hello. Dr. Jones, welcome to the show. Sure. I'm glad, happy to be here. So why don't you get started by telling us about your job and your current roles and responsibilities? Yeah, yeah. As you mentioned, I, I uh, went to medical school at Rutgers, did my residency uh, at University of Chicago, and then I'm now doing fellowship um, in pediatric emergency medicine here in D.C. So as a fellow, I pretty much work um, alongside the attendings of the emergency department. I oversee residents, nurse practitioners, PAs, um, and a variety of different cases in the emergency department, as well as traumas and uh, med alerts and codes. And why did you choose pediatrics as your specialty? I feel like Pete, when, when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, when you go through all those rotations in med school, PEDS is actually at the bottom of my list. In fact, I put PEDS like the end of end of third year for that reason, and largely because I thought I couldn't really like relate to kids, and I didn't really want to like learn that branch of medicine. And it was interesting because once I did that rotation, it was the one rotation that I felt I didn't feel like work, and I felt like every day felt like it felt like it was fun. It, it was you you were really impacting, you know, some of the most vulnerable people in our in our um, population and you really get to have to have fun doing it so I, I felt like I wanted to do something where um, it was in line with my passion and something that was in line with you know really enjoying myself and I really enjoyed my my field so so tell me with uh, within the field of pediatrics there's a, a lot of variety in the practice mm-hmm. whether you're doing outpatient inpatient um, ICU mm-hmm. um, tell me a little bit more about that yeah yeah so in pediatrics, it's just like it's just like um, internal medicine in the sense that you practice in outpatient settings, you practice on a, in a hospital setting, an emergency department, and in each setting it depends on the acuity of cases that you see. So obviously your outpatient settings are usually going to be a lower to no acuity, um, and that in pediatrics it generally is about preventive care, right? So a large part of it is well child checks and dealing with sort of common illnesses there. If a child gets sick enough that they need more and more urgent attention, you can go to like an urgent care or an emergency department to be evaluated. And if they deem that they are sick enough, then they usually go to the hospital. So the hospital floor would either be like your general pediatrics floor, um, which handles the things that require inpatient care. So things like asthma um, attacks are um, really bad, skin infections, common other illnesses like sickle cell disease, all those things we would manage on the floor. If you're really acutely sick and you need to be watched a little bit more closely, then you'll be put in the pediatric ICU, and that's just um, handles the things like um, exacerbations of people's diabetes, even very worse asthma exacerbations, a gambit of illnesses, but it all goes based off your acuity and severity of illness. And in the emergency department, what are some of the most common complaints or, or conditions that patients present with? Oh, uh, it depends on the day. Oh, uh, it's so much fun, which is why it's so much fun, because no two days are the same in the emergency department. Um, on some days, you're dealing with very high acuity patients, so you're dealing with kids who have been in trauma. So those are kids that um, have been in like motor vehicle accidents um, or any type of uh, physical injury. And then you're dealing with more or less acuity things with like um, you may be dealing with a patient with eczema who has an eczema flare up um, or a child who has um, sickle cell pain. So those are like, it's, it does, it's, there's no one common thing that you see. Every single day is a different thing. So That's awesome. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of variety. Mm. So at what point did you decide to pursue a career in medicine? Oh, that was in, I was in high school. Um, I grew up in South Jersey, and I grew up in a pretty, we were pretty, we were pretty poor as a family. Um, and so I knew I wanted to be in a career where like I did not want to have to worry about bills. Like I just want to be able to like, financially be secure. I can handle this. I got this. I'm good. And so I was between in 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 my world that was like a lawyer or a doctor. And so I picked lawyer because I was like I don't want to study science. Uh, <laughs> exactly. I can talk a whole lot and write a lot. 
so I wanted to do law, and then my mom made me go to a uh, vocational school. And there, you had to pick a trade, and she made me do engineering. And then I was like, okay, engineering is not my thing. I hate it. It's not like science and math. Um, then started doing more science classes, and I really started to like take to it very nicely. I was going to do biomedical engineering. That was my thing. Um, I realized I'm also really, really bad at math. Like, really bad but, at math. But you're better now. Uh, so so I, uh, I could not be an engineer. That was not going to work. Um, but I still like the biomedical aspect of biomedical engineering. So I thought about it. And I was like, yo, like, should I really pursue medicine? And I was like, I've never, no one in my family is a doctor. I've never seen a black doctor at that point in time. I didn't know black doctors. I knew they exist because I like heard of Cosby. But like, I've never been like, I've never actually, and so too bad, too bad. That was my role. Yeah, problem. he's okay. all we had growing um, up. <laughs> um, exactly. If I knew then what I what we know now. But yeah, having no role models, you just you don't visualize that. So in your brain, you're just like, all right, I guess that can work. So I bought this book, and I still have it on my bookshelf today. And it's it's called Becoming a Physician. And it's like maybe it's like maybe about a hundred pages, hundred fifty pages. And I bought that was my first book I ever bought from Amazon back in the day. How old were you? I was probably did you 16, 16, 17. And I read it cover to cover. Front ways, back ways. I read it. it goes and it goes through everything. It goes from college all the way to getting your first job as a physician. And I feel like I knew it. I got it. And then I was like deciding on schools, and I went and I went from there. So, so you went from high school to Rutgers, and then by the time you were in college, you knew that the goal was to become a physician. Yeah. No, I knew by the time I yeah by the time I left high school, I knew I was going to become a physician. Um. It was just a matter of getting into college, and that was always a tricky part: is choosing which college to go to um, and which can give you the best the best support. So, how did you position yourself at Rutgers to fulfill that dream? Yeah, so Rutgers is actually pretty unique as a state university. Um, they have a, a separate pre med program for students of color. Um, it's called ODASIS, which is like I think I believe it stands for the Office of Diversity, Academic Success, and, and the Sciences. Um, and Dr. Khan, who runs that um, program, is phenomenal in terms of how he can get students motivated and on track to be able to sort of become competitive applicants for medical school. Um, and so because of that, Rutgers is one of the top in the country for being able to produce um, doctors of color um, because the program is very strong. So so that that's how I sort of got, them to Ruck, got, got at Rutgers and sort of stayed at Rutgers for medical school. So, yeah, in and of itself, that's uh, it's proof that these pipeline programs do work. Yes. Mm-hmm. And they're so necessarily, like, they need to be funded. Um, I know right when I was there, they had just got a nice grant from the from the government. Um, but I don't, I, I think it's always needed for people to donate and for people to pay attention because these pipeline programs are essential for us to diversify medicine. What was the biggest obstacle you faced when you were applying to medical school? Um, so I think... What's the biggest obstacle? Um, The whole thing is an obstacle. (laughs) Uh, The whole whole process is an obstacle. It really is. One, it's a couple things. One is confidence in yourself. You immediately feel the imposter syndrome once you enter college in that pre med world. And once you tell someone you're pre med, people just size you up very differently than the rest of uh, of other colleagues. And it's always about like who's going to make it, who's going to fail. And then once you sort of have that faith in yourself to be like, you know, I got through bio one on one, got through chemistry, I got through orgo. You know, I, and I figured all this stuff out. Then it's really about trying to prove to others that you that you do have the, the skills necessary to get where you need to go. And that's and that's tricky because like you, you need the opportunity to be able to do that. And I think sometimes as much as much as I love Rutgers, but I think sometimes because it was so big, it was so hard to find those opportunities because you're competing with thousands of other pre medical students. But that's what's so great about having a pipeline program that was for minority students because out of those thousands, there's probably a handful of people of color that are also doing it. And then you start to sort of, instead of being a competition between us, it was more of us working together to get through it. Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, definitely good. They had that pipeline set up, but you had a little bit of help and support along the way. And it's incredible how similar your story is to my story and the things that I dealt with, the imposter syndrome, the lack of mentorship and guidance, and how different pipeline programs helped me along. And you touched on a buzzword with that uh, imposter syndrome. You know, it's it's not uncommon. So during your path through medical school, residency, training, um, and fellowship, do you have any examples of imposter syndrome that you had to overcome? Yeah, you know, it's funny is I feel like imposter syndrome 
is something that I feel like people tell you about. And then you don't realize it until you actually go through it. And you're like, oh, wow. I think I have imp- I have imposter syndrome from the first few days of medical school, the first few years of residency, because it's it literally is that feeling all the way back as a pre-med to be like, I'm worth it. I got this. I know what I know. I know what I know. Um, but I'm I'm supposed to be here. And I think that's the biggest thing. The last thing is like, I'm supposed to be here is what saves so what saves me at least. Um, because I think as much things as I get wrong, and I'm always worried about being a physician of color to be like, oh, like when I get things wrong, it just matters that much more. But I try not to try to that stress me out. Like I the first step is acknowledge it. Just acknowledge that you have imposter syndrome. And then once you acknowledge it, then you can actually see things that sort of help you address it. And, and I think once you stop and look around, you realize that people are actually looking up to you and you're coming off as very competent and, and very confident. Um, that's definitely the impression that I had uh, when I was working with you back in Chicago. I was always impressed by how you saw the big picture. And I know you were deeply invested in policy work to the point that that was part of your residency program where you actually earned a master's of public policy. Can you speak to us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So um, when I was in college, I, it goes back then, I wanted, I wanted to pick a major. And this is a good advice for all those pre-meds. Pick a major that you're actually going to love, that you're never going to be able to study ever again. And so I majored in cultural anthropology with a focus on political anthropology because um, I've always interested in politics and policy. Um, and I had no idea how to tie that to medicine until I learned about health policy. Um, so I got involved with the AMA and, um, the AAP, which is the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, in medical school. And then when I was applying to residency, I knew I wanted to do something that was involved with policy. And so I was looking at programs that allow you to do both. So either like a social medicine program or or a policy program that's tied to your residency. And University of Chicago was, as far as I know, the only program that allowed you to train in pediatrics and also obtain a master's in public policy. Um, which is what I did. Um, and it was really an eye-opening experience to be able to learn about health policy and then go back in the hospital the next day and, and practice and sort of see how good policy or even bad policy impacts the way you practice and impacts your your patients. And what would you say to those folks out there that are interested in getting involved in um, healthcare policy but don't know where to start? How How can they get involved? I think with health policy, it's so big. For, I mean, it's big, it's huge. It's, I mean, our healthcare system is huge and it's complex. There's so many players involved. I'm still learning it every day. Um, and I think the way I describe it is it's, it is essential to how you practice medicine, um, which is why I think every physician needs to have some knowledge of it or some awareness of it. Um, how you get involved with it is pretty much, I, I think the easy thing is pay attention to the news. Every single news, every single day, someone on the news is talking about something about healthcare or something about healthcare policy. Um, and you look at, I mean, when you look at debates and talking about Medicare for all, like li- obviously get it from like a legitimate source. Um, but read the articles, watch the YouTube videos, find people that in your program that are actually interested in and can actually give you some insight as to what their perspective, their viewpoints are. Um, and then I just build from there. I just like sort of, that's how I got interested. I was sort of just like, oh, that's interesting. What is the, what is the AC? Cause when I was in medical school was, or when we were in medical school was the ACA was, was getting um, written and pushed through. Um, and that was a big deal. We're like, what, what is What is this? What, what does this mean? Um, and I think that's what started me to be like, oh, you need to actually pay attention because the world around you is changing and the way you can practice, it's going to change too. So you need some voice to be able to figure that out. That's awesome. Uh, it's incredible how much of an impact you're actually able to have as, as one person in this field of public policy. Now, what is a common myth about pediatricians that you would like to dispel? <laughs> a common myth. Oh, I feel like the the, the stigmas um, are the misconceptions about pediatricians are all very positive in some ways. Um, is that we're all like very happy, go lucky people, which we are. I, I mean, one of the one of the reasons I didn't mention before, but I mean, is that I really like my colleagues. Like every field of pediatrics, like everyone is really chill. Everyone's really nice. Um, unlike some other fields that I've experienced, I'm not going to name anything, um, but, um, residents are generally very happy. Attendings are happy. Um, but I think a misconception is that like, because of that happiness that like all kids are healthy and we don't stress out about anything and we don't worry about anything like to deal with a very sick and our dying kid is a very traumatic thing that we deal with all, 
on a not so infrequent basis. Um, and that we do wear a smile on our face because that's essentially who we are. But we also are dealing with pretty complex and hard cases as well. And so I think a lot of times people are just like, peas is just like, um, just like smaller adults, but healthier. It's like, not really. <laughs> like, yes, kids are, kids are healthier than adults, but kids can have equally amount of complex issues, both medically and socially. Yeah, I always have to remind myself that, you know, as pediatricians, you guys do see a lot of really sick kids in bad circumstances, um, thinking of like different cases of suspected child abuse or child endangerment um, and has has to be tough to, to witness and to intervene in those cases. Yeah, no, those are always those are always tricky and hard to deal with. I think it's um, but that's that's also one of the reasons why people go into pediatrics is that you become a voice for those populations that can't speak for themselves. Now, it's pretty much impossible to get through medical school, residency, and fellowship as a black physician without encountering discrimination or racism in some form. Um, do you have any stories um, of situations or encounters that, that you've experienced that you wouldn't mind sharing with us? Sure, sure. I think being, I think it's hard, right? Because I think being a black, black physician is hard. I think being a black, at any level of any type of intersection, like my my story is more black and queer, but you know, black female physicians or anyone, any any anyone, anyone, any person of color shares a sort of similar story. Um, I will say, like, I do remember in residency when I was in an emergency room, um, I because you get to wear scrubs, which I I love wearing some scrubs. Um, but because you wear scrubs, um, and you're not dressed up, people automatically assume that you're the tech. Um, and so I, there was so many times where like my colleagues would be like, can you believe they assumed I was the nurse? And I was like, well, you get to be the nurse and I get to be the tech, uh, because, because there is so many times where like, I would go into a patient's room and they're like, they're ready for x-ray. And I'm like, cool. I, I know I ordered the x-ray. Like it's just, to be, it's just to be like, to get that sort of, um, to bite, fight back that bias to be like, you know, just because I'm, I'm a person of color and I'm a male and I'm wearing scrubs, doesn't mean that like, I can't be the physician too, right? Put um, put some respect in my name. Exactly, exactly. Or the one time was pretty funny. One time I was in the ED in residency, and I was like, hi, nice to meet you. I'm Dr. Nate Jones. And, they're like, and it was a black family. And they were like, wait, your last name is Jones? And I was like, yeah. They're like, so wait, wait, you're not Nigerian? I was like, no. <laughs> it's like, it's like, I appreciate all my Nigerian brothers and sisters out there, but I'm not Nigerian. So. There's a couple of us out here that are just regular black Exactly. Like we're still out here, guys. We're here. We're still we're still going to medical school too. So, so what do you do to uh, relax and to kick back when you're not working? Yeah, um, relaxing is funny um, because I feel like you could never ever relax when you're not in the hospital. But um, so I like to read. I'm a, re- a huge fan of reading and writing. Um, I tend to lately read more books about policy because um, I'm trying to brush up on a few things, especially given the current issues with COVID. Um, but when I'm not reading or doing any type of writing for any type of like advocacy work, um, it's generally like cooking, um, video games, uh, and trying to work out, but just always intermittent. So I don't know how effective I am with that. So, and what podcast or artist are you currently listening to? Ah, uh, yeah, I'm a huge podcast fan. So, so I always listen to the daily the New York times. Um, just to give my like brief sort of fix and and it doesn't really give you a fix of all the news, but just a little bit of news. Um, I'm a big NPR fan. So I listen to NPR politics and up first. Uh, I'd also love some good comedy and entertainment. So I do listen to the read, um, and pod save America, which is my little, my political podcast. Um, and then, um, still processing by the New York times is also one of a really good um, podcast as well. I listen to So, And now you can add the black doctors podcast to the list. (laughs) <laughs> yes, sir. I will be listening. I will be subscribing. <laughs> Cannot wait. Now, let's talk a bit about finances, because as we spoke of earlier, you know, people may be paralyzed by fear or lack of representation in medicine. But a lot of the times it comes down to the brass tax. It comes down to money. How do you finance and pay for a medical education? And how should people approach this dilemma, in your opinion? Ooh, that you are thinking on the right track. Um, I I wish I could tell you that like going to medical school is so free and that you like you don't you shouldn't worry about any financial costs and just go for your dream. Because ideally you should in a real in a perfect society you should be able to do that. 
But I think being a person of color, especially if you're coming from a family or a situation of a little means, um, it is significant to understand that you're taking on a six-figure debt. Um, and to understand what that return on investment looks like um, is very important to, to look at. Because if you look at our colleagues that go to law school or go to business school, um, their return on investment is way higher than ours. Um, so you really have to have a strong passion for this. Because there, you once you get the price tag at the end of the four years, which I know you and I both got that little... Uh, <laughs> That actual bill at the end was actually showed you with all the lows about it, and your heart jumps for a little bit, and like I owe a house, um, that it, it hits you. But I think like what I do it all over again, yeah, because I think I followed my passion. I followed something that I truly wanted to do, and yeah, I'm gonna be paying for it. Um, but luckily, like we do make eventually, eventually after all these years of training, you will make you will make enough money to be able to pay this back and be okay. Um, but I, I think I think paying attention to it financially is always an important thing to think about beforehand. But well, we definitely appreciate your sacrifices and the fact that you were able to come join us and share so candidly your life story and some of the things you've struggled with and some of the uh, ways you've succeeded. Um, how can our listeners contact you if they want to follow up and learn more about the pediatrics or public policy or whatever the case may be? Yeah, so you can reach me on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is uh, at doctor, that's D-R. Nate, N-A-T-E, uh, M-D. Um, probably the best way of reaching me. Um, and then my Instagram and everything is also listed on my Twitter page, too, so you can find me all there. Well, Dr. Jones, thanks again for joining us on the Black Doctors Podcast, where you will hear our stories told by us. All right, take care.